Okay, so to, today I'm happy to introduce Craig Hensley. Uh, Craig um, is a member of uh, the Nature Trackers uh, program for Texas Parks and Wildlife, and I saw him speak about this at a conference, and you may have too, a state conference two or three years ago, and it's pretty fascinating. And one of the things that was really fascinating uh, when he and another guy were out after dark and calling owls. That was quite impressive. So um, he's been in that program for about three years, uh, educating people throughout Texas on the use and the value of iNaturalist. So if you had uh, wondered about how to use that a little bit better, I think you will find that out today. Um, and uh, he uses it to uh, document the flora and the fauna in Texas. Um, he, in the Texas Nature Tracker, for instance, on uh, Facebook Live on most Saturday mornings, oh. he is out. Uh, on some area, like a couple of weeks ago, I think he was in Cibolo Creek area, identifying all the flora and the fauna there. It was pretty fascinating. So he has a Bachelor of Science degree in Fisheries and Wildlife Management and a Master's in Zoology. He's an avid birder, and he includes uh, being a federally licensed bird bander. Okay. And he uh, photographs all things that are natural, and I'm sure he puts them all in on that as well. Um, he has shared his passion for the natural world from Minnesota to Texas. Is that right? Got your start there. Okay. Uh, and then afterwards, and you might want to stay behind for this and speak with him about that. He's leading a bio blitz at Clear Creek. Is anybody involved in going to that right after the meeting? Okay. We have a few people doing that. That's great. So, um, and everybody's invited. So David Jones could not be here today. Uh, so I wanted to be able to introduce him anyway. So welcome, Craig. Thank you. How's everybody doing today? Good. Well, I was out at Clear Creek this morning, and so uh, the, the project has already got observations in it. So for those of you, I know it's going to be a little, it was 55 out there. I, I live in Bernie. We haven't seen 55 since, I don't know, four years or something like that. Um, so it was just joyous to walk around out there this morning. Saw some nice things as well. So neat, neat little area. Um, uh, but I was disciplined enough to get here on time for the uh, presentation. So I guess what I think what's happening is my understanding is that after the meeting breaks up, people are going to get lunch and then we're going to go up there and, and do a bio blitz for a couple of hours and just uh, document some things. If you have if you're um, if you have the time and are interested and you're even if you're not um, real comfortable with iNaturalist yet, that the idea is for you to come on out and kind of get more comfortable with it. One of the things you'll find out with iNaturalist, if you get trained on it and you never use it, um, well, then it's not really worth the training you took to get it uh, going. So it's one of those things, the more you use it, the better off you are. So um, the other thing, I, before I get started, I just wanted to give a plug for those education days you all are doing. Um, I've been an environmental educator for 30 some years. And as I've told uh, one of your classes, what, a year ago at the graduation, um, of all the things you can do as a master naturalist, there's nothing more important than educating kids. And I, and I say that as an educator who's talked to probably, literally probably a million children in my life. Um, I counted it up one time. I think I'm over it, uh, over that. Um, uh, what we do, none of it matters if the kids don't care. And so, um, and the other thing I'll tell you is that I know, I know that idea of using scripts is appealing um, I don't know if you're like me, but I can't, I, if I think of, about a script and I'm a stumbling, bumbling idiot, because um, I'm trying to remember the words that were in the script. And then the thing, keep in mind when you're out on a nature walk, every day is different. And every time you do the same trail, it's different. So don't get lost in trying to be an expert. Get interested because you're trying to interest the kids in just exploring nature. So you don't have to know everything in order to lead a, a nature walk. It's about your attitude and your, your excitement and bringing your passion to the natural resources and sharing that with them as much, because most of those kids aren't gonna remember the difference between a slippery elm and an American elm. They're just not. Most of us as adults can't. So why are we forcing kids to? Okay, um, so it's more about how does it feel? What's it look like? You know, those kinds of things are as important and I don't care what grade level it is. So anyway, I encourage you, hopefully that's an okay plug to give. Um, <laughs> but uh, as a dyed in the wool uh, uh, naturalist and, and educator, um, it really is probably the most important thing you can do as a master naturalist. So 
Anyway, what I want to talk today, how many of you have used iNaturalist regularly? Okay, good. So some of this is going to be a rehash. I've cut some stuff out, um, um, but some of this is going to be rehashed. Hopefully it's a reinforcement of some things as well. So, uh, and then for those of you that haven't used it a lot, hopefully you can learn a few things. If you have questions, don't hesitate to ask. Um, I'm going to talk about our program a little bit, talk about iNaturalist in terms of the phone app and then why it's important. And then we're going to go on to the internet live and I'm going to show you how to download, download photographs from um, directly from your camera, if you're using a camera. And then also just give you a tour of the web page because my, as my former colleague Tanya used to say, the, uh, the app is a data collection tool, the party is the website, okay? That's where the party is. Because that's where you can do all kinds of things on the website that you can't do on the app. All right, so first of all, our program, Texas Nature Trackers, and by the way, I said former staff member, Tanya, I don't know if she's ever come up and done a program up here, but she's now the new state ornithologist, which is a huge deal for her, um, but uh, now I'm a staff of one, so uh, <laughs> we were a staff of two. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> we'll be filling that hopefully in the next few months. So our team was, is comprised of four people called the Community Stewardship and Engagement Team. And basically what our, I, our role is, is to go out and engage the general public to get them interested in nature. And we use iNaturalist as a tool to help with that. We're part of the Wildlife Diversity Program, which is basically the non-game program um, with Texas Parks and Wildlife. What, uh, again, what we're trying to do is create community scientists. We don't expect everybody to become a biologist. We just want people engaged enough so that they care. And the only way to get them to care is to get them outside and get them exposed to nature and all the cool things that are out there. And if you, if you can do that, then you might be able to create some community scientists because the idea is every county in the state has one biologist assigned to it. And some of those biologists have multiple counties. They cannot run around and keep track of every rare or endangered species or even non-rare non or endangered species by themselves. It's impossible. And so a lot of times when it comes to making decisions on conservation for, re for species, a lot of those decisions are made on the best science, but that's usually very incomplete science. And so by getting people like you all out there taking pictures of things and just putting a marker as, hey, I found this there, so when it becomes a, a, a point where a biologist or a scientist or a researcher needs to know where can you find these critters now, iNaturalist has that log of where those places are. So it can be a big, big help. Um, and of course, the other thing about it, just to be on the selfish side, it's a great tool for you to learn what's around you, right? Because how many times have we been out and you go, wow, what, what in the world is that? Now you can use iNaturalist take a picture of it, and most of the time it's gonna help you identify what it is, okay? So it's a really powerful tool. We use it to, to kind of engage the naturalist community, the citizen scientists, as I mentioned. We have projects that we monitor, and then some of that data gets from there all the way to the research and conservation community. And there was a time where you, you talk to most biologists, and I will tell you right now, there are still biologists that go, we don't really want any data from those people out there. Okay, they think that only sci hardcore scientists can provide you information. But if you start looking at the scientific literature now and you look at nature books, a lot of them have data from iNaturalist, from eBird, from a lot of those apps that are out there that we are contributing massive amounts of data to. So that argument is falling uh, apart as, as we move forward. <coughs> Excuse me. As I mentioned, we've got 12 projects that we monitor. Um, we are focused on what are called species of greatest conservation need. I'll show you what that is in a second. And the idea is to get information about those species um, into what's known as the Texas Natural Diversity Database. And basically what that is, is a holding tank where we have information on rare plant communities, animal communities, plants or animals themselves. So that let's say TexDOT is going to put in a road. One of their requirements is they have to come to um, the database and make sure that there's not any rare species where they're going to be doing all that construction. Ideally, everybody would use it, but they're not, not everybody's required to. So what is an SGCN, a species greatest conservation need is a native plant or animal that is declining or rare and in need of some kind of attention to keep it from becoming threatened or endangered. 
there are people out there that go, yeah, yeah, you just want everything to be threatened and endangered so we can't do anything with our land and you'll come take our land if we have it on there and big government, blah, blah, blah. Um, the reality is we are trying to get things off those lists. Millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars have been spent trying to save the whooping crane, right? And continue to be sent save, to try to save the whooping crane. We've saved the bald eagle but it costs millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. So wouldn't it make more sense to know what the status of the, all those species are out there and then take steps to make sure that they don't get to where we have to spend millions and millions and millions of dollars to conserve one species. So economically, it makes more sense to know what we have, where they are in, their, in terms of their population and then make sure we don't put them, get those, those things to that list and ideally, I'd like to be able to not, uh, not have died and be able to say, hey, we got them all off the list. What a day for celebration, right? I don't know that it's gonna happen in my lifetime, but um, a, a, a person's got a dream. These are some of those, um, we have over 12, almost 1300 in just in the state of Texas alone that are considered SGCN. These are classified by taxobiologists based on the best scientists that, or science that we have for those species across the state. They include everything from the Texas horned lizard and the Houston toad to the bobwhite. So a lot of people go, well, why would a bobwhite be, why would you still hunt a bobwhite if it's uncommon? It's a managed species, so it can be. Um, today, when I was out at the, the um, uh, um, Clear Creek, I had, there were two wood ducks, okay? Um, there was a time where they actually had to stop hunting wood ducks because their populations almost disappeared. Now wood duck populations have come back and they still manage them. They still now hunt them again, but we're able to do that. We can do both things that, you know, we can walk and talk at the same time, right? So we should be able to do that, but we have to get those populations stabilized first. So we have our own webpage, Texas Nature Trackers. There are the 12 projects. They range from the Herps of Texas all the way down to monitoring bald eagle nests across the state. Um, and so there's a wide variety of ways that you can contribute information to these 12 projects. We also have a, our program also has a, what's called a camera trap program, a loan program. Basically we provide chapters with 10, five to 10 game cameras. You all set up your own project um, and you can put them out for six months at a time and monitor, you know, so if it's at Clear Creek, for example, if you wanted to be able to know what mammals live out there because the game cameras obviously is best for mammals most of the time. You can put those out in places where they're not gonna get stolen. They, we've got locks, we train everybody and we turn, them, turn you loose to develop your own project. And it's actually kind of cool. We've had several chapters that um, have done it and we've got a couple that are working on it right now. We are also doing some bird research. One of the projects is on uh, down in the Bernie area um, outside of San Antonio where we're focusing on grasshopper sparrows and lacan sparrows. Uh, with a, a winter bird banding project. We have a lot of master naturalists in that local area that are working on them. Most of our grassland birds are declining or ha uh, some of them 50 to 60% or more. So there's a lot of interest in knowing what, what is going on uh, with these bird populations. The other uh, project we have is at Old Settlers Park in Round Rock. And that's working on the loggerhead shrike. How many of you have seen a loggerhead shrike? What do we know, what do we know them as beside loggerhead shrike? The old butcher bird. These are the birds. If you've ever walked along a fence line and you saw a grasshopper impaled on a fence, on a barb on a fence line, it didn't jump on there and commit suicide. <laughs> it was a loggerhead shrike. And so we're actually color banding the shrikes and monitoring a breeding population in Round Rock, which is this is a huge park that is all recreation. It's all baseball fields, softball fields, soccer fields, football fields, and loggerhead shrikes, which are a bird that's declining all over the United States seems to be thriving in this park um, in the middle of all these people. And uh, I mean, at night it is packed with people. They nest in the trees right in the middle of the parking lots. So um, we're, we've been monitoring these for a few years now and we'll continue to do so to see how they're doing in Texas. We do have a Facebook page, uh, Texas Nature Trackers uh, uh, that you can follow if you want to. We post a lot of videos. Uh, and other things, I do some live events, but not, any, not every Saturday anymore. I think that would get boring for everybody. Um, but um, yeah, I was, in, I was at Cibolo. I do a lot of them from Bernie, uh, but I was at Hagerman National Wildlife Refuge uh, a couple of weeks ago. 
Got to see some uh, spoonbills and a couple of wood storks. If you watch that video, you'll notice that I was a little bit excited about that. Um, simply, and they are not, these are not scripted. So if you ever go and follow our page and you watch one of these videos, you'll go, oh my God. Um, maybe they should be, I don't know. Um, but they're a lot of fun to do and people like to follow them. People will sit on Saturday mornings and eat breakfast while they're watch, you know, watching us walk around, um, figuring out what's going on out there. We also have a uh, Instagram page where we do a lot of posting as well, if you follow Instagram. Uh, so those are our social media outlets. So uh, iNaturalist, first of all, um, in 2013, the TNT program, which has been around a long time collecting data by paper. If you have been a nat master naturalist for a long enough time, you may have participated in the frog and toad surveys from many, many years ago. We've got all kinds of paper documentation on those kind of things. Well, in 2013, we started using iNaturalist, which was developed by some college kids in California um, because it was a great way to get a lot of people involved and get a lot of data collected. And it was on the computer and we didn't have to have paper copies doing everything. So iNaturalist itself is a, is a, is, was created to be an online social network. They had two goals, was to connect people to nature and also then to get data. So they figured, I think I, this is how I imagine it. They probably thought, you know, people are taking pictures of their new shoes and their dinner and, you know, um, their new puppy or whatever um, and posting it to Facebook. So why not, you know, figure out a way that they could actually help us with uh, the na documenting the natural world. And again, also giving everybody the opportunity to learn things what, about what are around them. As of yesterday, or no, is today the 15th? Yeah, this morning. Um, Globally, there have been 114 million observations of iNaturalist. Uh, in Texas, there are now, we're approaching 7 million observations. Now, not all of these are important to us at this point. Um, we don't really look at all the observations of white-tailed deer um, or raccoons um, or a few, some of those other things, but there, in, within that 6.7 million uh, observations, there's a lot of data that we can use to better understand the flora and fauna of the state of Texas. So how it works, basically, you download the app, which most of you know, you uh, take a picture of something, now you can do sound. We're going to walk through that real quickly for you. And you share it with the other iNaturalist users. One of the things that a lot of iNaturalist users get frustrated with, they put something on there that they don't know and nobody ever identifies it and they're waiting and waiting and waiting. You have to remember, they're not people just sitting there going with bated breath. There's one. Um, there are a few geeks. One lives in the Dallas Fort Worth area. <laughs> I'm still trying to aspire to get even close to that guy, uh, Sam, of course, um, Sam biologist, <laughs> Sam Kishnick. Um, but um, one of the things about iNaturalist, if you're going to use it regularly, join projects. And we'll show you that online here in a little bit. Join projects that are focused on the taxa groups that you like. They're all over the place. And by following those projects, then what will happen is you'll start to pick up people interested in identifying those things that you've put on there. And you may get more identifications that way. Because, again, we're trying to build a community. And if you're on an island out here, it's hard to build a community, right? Okay. So how it really works, of course, you have to have an account. It's free to do. Of course, you have to have evidence, which now can be a sound recording. Uh, a photo from your photo files or an actual photo that you just took. Um, what you saw, one of the things that uh, also helps with iNaturalist is if you take a picture and you don't know what it is exactly, I'll bet you know whether it's a plant or animal, right? Okay, most of the time. Um, now, if you're underwater and you're taking a picture of a diatom, I don't know, you know what they classify those at at this, at this point, but most of us aren't doing that. So one of the keys is to put some kind of tag on it. So if it's a flowering plant, just say, you know, when, when he gives you choices, just pick the most basic thing. That way, at least if you just leave it as unknown, most people really won't look at it that quickly. But if it's a plant or if you say this is a butterfly, I think, or whatever, at least it starts the identification process and learning process for you. And then when you saw it, the nice thing about our cell phones, it has the dates and timestamp on there. You don't really have to do anything there. And then where you saw it for our purposes, for Texas Parks and Wildlife is really important. Accuracy helps us know exactly or almost exactly where that record is. 
But a lot of people go, I don't want to necessarily show the exact location. So you can actually protect location data, still share it with projects. And those people that are monitoring those projects who are you, basically when you say, okay, I'm going to join this project, that means you trust them to not abuse your data. They can still see that data, but you can protect that observation location data from the general public if you choose to do that. We'll show you that. So basically, when you take an observation, you're creating a digital voucher. iNaturalist is great at recording a location of what you just took a picture of. It doesn't tell you anybody where they're not. You can't take a picture and post it and go, see, there's no horned lizard right here. Okay, so you, you, it's only recording presence. So keep that in mind. It's also not recording numbers. Unless you put a note and say, I saw a flock of 50 cedar wax wings, and here's a picture of one of them. Then you can make a note to that effect, but it's not really doing a population survey. So after you create an account, um, I'm going to skip, go through this because you can either do it through your phone or you can do it online. Um, if you're new to iNaturalist, I usually tell people create your account online because there's one adjustment you have to make, which I'll show you, uh, is, which is the time zone. If you've created your account on your uh, phone, you can't change the time zone, which is defaulted to Hawaii. And I don't think this is Hawaii. So you have to go on to the computer to do that. And especially that's really important with bio blitzes. And I, it sounds like you all do bio blitzes. Um, you've got to make sure that your account is set up for central standard time um, because those timed events, your observations may not go into the project if you're in the wrong time zone, okay? All right, so that's all that. So the app itself. So if you're, uh, all of these photographs are going to show the uh, iPhone on the left, uh, the Android on the right. Um, the screens may look a little bit different on your phone, depending on how old your phone is. Uh, but basically, this is what it looks like. Um, so you have four, when you go, and, and let me go back. So when you click on the camera for the iPhone or the plus sign in the green circle over there, that's going to take you to the camera. You've got four options. Notice I said three earlier. There's actually four. One you can take with the camera through iNaturalist. One of the things to remember with that is you can't edit your photograph in iNaturalist when you take the picture. Okay, there's a way, there's work around there. Um, you can use your camera roll, all those pictures that are on your camera. You can go and pull those off and directly into iNaturalist. You can record sound now, which is really nice. So now you don't have to have a separate sound app to be able to pick up the sound and then transfer it over to iNaturalist. And let's say you're out there and all of a sudden a flock of, of whooping cranes fly over. Lucky you. Um, but you can't get a picture of it, but you can at least say, hey, I saw a flock of these. Now, nobody's going to be able, you're not going to be able to prove, prove it because you have no photo evidence of it or sound. But you can still, for your own purposes, document, hey, this is, I was standing here one day and I saw whooping cranes fly over. So that kind of thing. So, for example, at my house, I have my own project. And if a pair of some, if I've had uh, sandhill cranes fly over the house, and my property line extends from the picket fence to the heavens. So if it flies through my airspace, it's my bird. Okay, so I can put it on that project and nobody can prove me wrong. So anyway, so generally, if you're going to first, if you do the camera roll, you can go there, you select the, the picture or pictures you want um, right there. You add them, you get your record. This is exactly what happens when you have a photograph in iNaturalist, and then you process that, uh, which doesn't take that much. We'll show you that in just a moment. Um, if you're gonna do a record of sound now, it's actually, and it actually the, these phones work so well at recording sounds. The key with recording sounds is a lot of people record and they only do it for three or four seconds. And you hear them shuffling through the gravel, talking to their friend, be careful if you're gonna record sound, what you're saying. Um, if you're going to put it on iNaturalist, um, that Craig, he's a moron. Um, you know, I haven't heard that yet, um, but I'll be checking the project this afternoon later when I get home. Um, but, um, but it actually does pretty well, but record for at least 10 seconds, okay, so that it has a chance to pick up, especially if it's a bird, because the birds will, sing, you know, they'll call or sing, and then they stop for a moment. Don't just take one, if, if you can, if the bird cooperates or the frog cooperates, record multiple sounds of it okay the other thing is with sounds is sometimes you're out in the early morning and the cardinals over here and the chickadees over here and the titmouse is over here and 
and you're recording, you're picking them all up, you might put in a note, hey, I'm looking for the bird at this number of seconds. What, what is this bird? Now identifiers, and there still are a lot of people not identifying bird sounds because they don't feel comfortable with it. That's one of my favorites to go and do. But so that's why I'm telling you at least 10 seconds and then try to say, hey, I want the bird I want identified is about five seconds into the recording. Otherwise I may just record, say, well, here's one, one of them is this one and move on. of nothing. That happens a lot. <laughs> that does happen. Unfortunately, the birds don't always cooperate with us, right? But again, if you leave it on long enough, hopefully you'll get it. And again, sometimes a lot of times you hear the bird, you get it, you fumble with your phone, you turn it on, and then the bird never makes another sound. And that's just the way it is. Then you can just cancel it, okay? If you know you didn't get a recording, instead of going ahead and posting, because I find a lot of recordings with nothing, literally nothing. Um, just cancel it and move, and then hopefully it calls again. Yes. No, that's the, the other thing about this. It does not, the artificial intelligence doesn't recommend sounds for you like it does with pictures. So that's where if you don't know what it is, when it comes up and says, what did you see? Just type in, start typing in bird, and it'll say AVs, and you, you, at least you put a tag on it. So that that is one of the downsides. One of the other things, one of the other apps you can use, this gets starts to get ridiculous. There's how many of you have heard of the app Merlin? Okay, really good at picking up bird sounds. So one of the things you could do is have your Merlin app on, record the sound on iNaturalist, and Merlin will oftentimes tell you what the bird is, and then you can type that in, but you're still documenting. Merlin, of course, saves those recordings. So um, that that information is still valuable. Yeah. So let me, let me, let me, let's go through that. That's a great question. So first of all, you turn on the microphone to start your recording. Um, when you're done, you, uh, you can, it'll say pause. So you can say pause and then hit um, save recording. And then it's gonna show up in your account up here like with a microphone. That's where the recording is. So if you click on that, it'll open that up and you can push play to play it again. So you can do that. So the, again, what did, what did you see? You're gonna type in something. Once you start typing, it'll populate whatever you type, but it's not going to, the AI doesn't pick it up and anticipate what it is or guess what it is. And this one I happen to know is a cardinal, but you would process the same way. And then also you always know your songs are different because it's a different symbol. Obviously it's not a photograph. Now, one, that said, let's say you want to record the sound and you've got your camera over here and you're, you're recording the sound here and you save it on iNaturalist as a sound. You later, if you get a picture of it, you could go combine the two off your off your web page. So you can actually put those together if you want to. All right, so now let's take a picture, just a regular photograph using iNaturalist. And one thing I, mem I remember I mentioned that you can't edit your photograph when you take it on using the I when you have iNaturalist open and you take a picture. So the other thing you can do is take a picture with your regular phone camera edit the picture, especially if things that are small and you're trying to get them so iNaturalist can see it, like insects or small flowers, take a good picture. One of the things that a lot of people do is take a lot of blurry pictures, okay? So make sure that it's a clear enough picture that somebody could actually identify it, okay? Um, but you can use that camera, you can do a quick edit, and then you can go to your camera, your, your, your store of photographs and upload it from there. So that's something just to kind of keep in mind. So you take a picture. Let's say you want to take more than one picture of it. Well, you've got one picture. If you click on the, uh, let's see if I, there we go. There's the one picture. You can click on that box with a plus sign. It'll reopen your app. And it'll say, do you want to take another picture? You can take multiple pictures. And that can be really valuable for plant identification, especially. Um, there is a composite blooming out on the trail right now. That is a sunflower, and when I pulled it up today, it gave me about four choices, and they all look alike. So the more pictures you can take of that plant, okay, the flower, the leaves, the stem, the whole plant, 
the better off you're going to be in terms of identification later, whether it's you or whether it's somebody else on iNaturalist. Again, you click on this. The great thing is it's going to give you choices. If it's a generic choice and you don't know the exact species, pick the generic choice. Again, it puts a flag on it so somebody can come back and help you with the later identification. If you do know it, just pick it and then it will populate there. Then you've got your date and time already here, so you don't have to worry about that. Then this one right here, that's your location data. If you click on that, it's going to open up a map. It can either be a satellite map or a street map, and you can pinch the, the, and move your image around to pinpoint exactly where it is if you want to. And then there's geo privacy. It's set to be open, which means everybody can see the actual lat longitude, the exact data uh, location of where it is. But you have choices. You can go obscured, which just gives you a big blue box with a dot, random dot in it, or you can go full on private where nobody sees anything on the map except the people that are in projects that you've submitted to. Okay. So you can, pr pr you can protect that data, location data. Another one really important for those of us that are going out there today, if you're taking pictures in the gardens, are those wild or they're native, but are they wild? if they're in a garden bed. <laughs> Most of the time you would say they are cultivated if they're in a defined bed, right? But what happens when they drop seeds and new plants came up and you didn't plant it, you know you didn't plant that there. So now is it a wild plant or is it, you, sometimes you just have to make you know, the best determination. But that's the one where you can, uh, it's defaulted to wild, you just click to change that if it's a plant that's in your garden. So again, one of the things I do at my yard, I have a, I've planted 199 species of native plants in my little tiny yard. They're not all still there, but one of the things I do every spring when they start to bloom, I, I take, go out and take a picture of it because I want to understand the phenology of each of those, the flowering times of those. So, and it's cultivated every time and nobody tries to identify your stuff if you say it's cultivated. It's really frustrating, okay? That's not helpful. So we need cultivated, we need people, we need to cultivate a cadre of people that will take a pic, look at pictures, people's pictures in gardens and help them identify it or else what's the point? Then of course there's projects. Some projects you actually have to move a little toggle switch over to have them go into that project. Most of, most of the projects are called collection projects. They just automatically funnel into the project. You don't have to do anything special. Finally, you hit share, or you hit that little checkbox, and your observation's there. So what do we have here? Okay, so when this was identified, it may have well said we think it's a black vulture, but just to show you what can happen with iNaturalist, these were alternate choices. I particularly like the American bison, the rare two-legged American bison. The bear, however, disagrees. So, and I have to give credit, that slide is from Tanya, so. Um, but I've had, we were, one of my first workshops I ever did, we had somebody taking a picture of a fungus, a shelf fungus on a rotting log. It came back, first choice, river otter. So I'm just saying it's not always 100% accurate, okay? And the other thing iNaturalist can't do, it can't take a four millimeter long um, bee, of which there are 33 species of them that are four millimeters long, and identify it to species, okay? I have a guy that's a master naturalist. He's a friend of mine. He calls me every two or three months and goes, I've been taking all these pictures of bees, and I don't understand why iNaturalist can't identify them to species. Most scientists can't identify them to species. How do you expect one little photograph to do it? They actually have to put them under a microscope, look at individual hairs on the bottom of the abdomen. iNaturalist doesn't have that capability. So you have to be realistic with it. But that said, does a pretty darn good job. So now some photography tips. Um, if you really want super good close-up photographs, if you're coming out with me today, um, I've got a bunch of these things called Zenvos. They're a 15 power magnifier. You can attach to your phone, high quality glass, really well made. And, and it takes unbelievable pictures of small things on your phone. You can even shoot videos through this thing, which I've done with uh, 
pollinators and things like that. So if you need, if you've got small things, those flowers up in the upper uh, right hand corner there are from a plant called elbow bush. Each flower is about three to four millimeters tall. That's a pretty sharp photograph. I couldn't get that with the phone. So that's a nice enhancement. That's, the, uh, that's a, a twig of a uh, walnut tree. Looks like a little what? <laughs> there you go. It's amazing what you can see when you start looking at pictures. Yeah, do you see the what looks like little eyeballs right here? Yeah, the, yeah, right there. I see exactly what you're talking about. And there's his ears. No, or horns. So, yeah. Good observation, by the way. I like that. Um, so you take a picture. This picture I took this with my camera when it was a uh, the lens was a, um, a close-up lens. So I took this from about 70 yards away. If I put this on a naturalist like that, what's it gonna to try to identify? Probably the tree. So this is where, because it was on a camera, I take it home and I put it on my computer. I do my editing. It's not a picture I'm gonna hang on the wall, but it's now good enough that it, will, it identified it as a Sage TV. Okay, so editing your pictures does help. Sometimes when you're taking pictures of things, you get multiple species or you get a really, what looks like a really terrible photograph there. But I put that on iNaturalist and iNaturalist identified that correctly as an upland sandpiper, just based on the silhouette. So don't, again, it's amazing what it can do. Sometimes you get multiple species. The best thing to do is to crop that picture and do each one as uh, its own observation. If you don't, then it's gonna try to figure out which one do you want me to identify. If you're gonna pick one, it's not gonna pick them both, okay? Snow goose on the left, Ross's goose on the right. Uh, bird nests do count, but the best way to do that is if they have eggs, because the eggs are usually pretty unique between species. The nests are not, and the babies all look like little hairless, bug-eyed, closed-eyed, pink-skinned, you know, with their mouth wide open. They all look alike at, cer at a certain stage. Most of them are going to see. So make sure you have the eggs in there. That'll help. Yes. Yes. There is, you know, there is a, there are scat projects out there. If you go and just look up scat on on the search for the projects, and I'll show you where, how to do that. Um, you can find those and join them, and then you'll find scatologists that will help you identify it. Yeah, not all scat can be identified, but a lot of it can be. It's pretty amazing. I'm I'm guessing without ever seeing it, raccoon. Just cause. <laughs> um, so when you're taking pictures of photographs of wildflowers, I always say get multiple photographs. You think about it when you go to a taxonomic key of the plants of anywhere. Usually in our on our field guides, it's one a beautiful picture of the flower, right? But then it's this sunflower and this sunflower and this sunflower and this sunflower and this sunflower. And if you can't see the leaves or be able to feel the texture or whatever, they all look alike. Okay. So get as good a close picture as you can. Take another picture of the inflorescence, all of the flowers. Notice my hand's in there now. Now I have some scale, okay? Turns out I needed it for this picture. And then I take a picture of the stem with the leaves because that can be very important. And then I, with, with wildflowers, I'll try to take a picture of the whole plant. The more information you give others to help you identify it, if you don't know what it is, the better, the better chance you have of getting it identified. Yes. You can take as many as you want. Yep, just one, you'll have to do them one at a time. Or you can take them on your camera and then you can batch load them. Yeah, a bunch at a time. <coughs> Excuse me, please. Um, when you're doing woody plants, the most basic photograph you can get is a leaf with, the, with it attached to the stem. You do any kind of taxono taxonomy on trees and, and shrubs, one of the first things they do after they ask you if it's a gymnosperm or an angiosperm, you know, uh, something where the leaves fall off or something where the leaves stay on, how are the leaves arranged? Are they opposite on the stem, alternate on the stem, whirled on the stem where there's more than two leaves at one junction, which is called the node? Um, that's really important, valuable information for learning to identify those trees and all woody plants for that matter. And then if you find other characteristics, some, sometimes you can take a picture of the bark of the tree and it'll actually identify it correctly. Just the bark, which is actually, again, another plus for iNaturalist. 
So if you find uh, fruit, obviously take a picture, tendrils, prickles, thorns, things like that, that'll help. When you're doing invertebrates, they can be a bear to get because you got this little phone and they've got compound eyes with, you know, some of them have 30,000 little eyes staring at you. So, you know, just your breathing causes them to move. So getting close is hard. But if you do take pictures of them with cameras or if you get lucky enough that they they hold for you, um, with dragonflies and damselflies, they're very territorial. So they have, it seems like they have, I will call them favorite perches. Um, they'll come and reuse the same perch over and over again. And you can get close enough to that same perch that you can eventually be in position when it comes back and take a picture of them. Now, uh, now I will give you the caveat, those are taken with the camera, but I stock them. So um, when you take pictures of spiders, take a picture of the, the dorsal surface, the back of them, because that's how they're presented in field guides for identification, not with the legs underneath. And then with butterflies, if you can get open or closed, if you really get lucky, both, because they oftentimes are a little bit different. And same thing with other invertebrates. So yes. <laughs> yeah. You want that story? So you see that log, right? The piece of wood right there. There was a stump in the Guadalupe River, and I was wading out in the river, and they were this, this damselfly kept landing on it. So I got right next to it and waited for it to come back. Took pictures of it, took them home, didn't like them, so I thought well, I'm going to go out tomorrow. So I go out the next day to the same stump, and I'm taking pictures, and all of a sudden I notice overnight a dragonfly had come up out of the water, shed its skin, and flew off. So that's the, that's the exuvia, the shed skin of a dragonfly with that damselfly, which probably could be eaten by the dragonfly, sitting on top of his now non-existent eyeballs. So you don't get that picture very often, but I'm glad you noticed it. Uh, I didn't notice it immediately, it was crazy. I've already mentioned that sounds count for birds, amphibians, crickets. You can try grasshoppers, whatever makes sound. You can try it. Uh, again, a lot of people are not identifying sounds right now. Um, I took that bird walk I took this morning, on, put it on uh, eBird. Most of the birds I recorded were all by hearing because you just can't find them, right? So you can learn your bird song. There was a time I didn't know them. Tracks count, as does roadkill. You're going to do roadkill, be very careful. So that you don't, you know, join the party. Um, and I say that in all seriousness. There's a lot of narrow roads out here. Some types of different types of iNaturalist projects. Today we're going to be doing a bio blitz. You all know, you've all heard, at least heard, that you all do bio blitzes. So bio blitz basically is a timed event, and it can be two hours, it can be a day, it can be a week or three weeks, like the pollinator bio blitz. It's just a timed event, and basically what you're doing is taking a snapshot of what's out there at that point in time. And so, like, for some places, they might do it seasonally. Because let's say you do one bio blitz at a place, and you do it in the spring. Well, that's lovely, but what's blooming in the, in the fall? So if you're really trying to get a good inventory, or you're a landowner, you've got to be able to do it periodically. But over time, you can, get, you can get a, gain a lot of information. Plus, it's a lot of fun, actually. Um, and by the way, that's the that's the project that we're doing today. Here's the ongoing one. Almost 11,000 observations at Clear Creek. By some of you probably have a bunch of them. I don't know who those people are, but um, so this is a site-based collection project. So they start a project, they make a map of it, start the project, and anybody that goes out there at any time and takes a picture and puts it on iNaturalist, it's automatically going to upload into this project. Okay. Yes, sir. I know. I saw that today on my project. So what you probably need to do, and it's all about the satellites and how the maps are drawn. So if the map, and so depending on, it may be depending, I noticed all of mine looked like they came up to the state park. So you can go in and try to pinpoint those a little better, but they should because the project map is only the, the preserve area. I don't know if that's a part officially that somebody else put Ray Roberts and encompassed all of that or not i don't know and that may be why that's happening but i've taken pictures of the same plant at the same place literally right there and one of them will say bernie texas and the other one will say fair oaks and i'm standing in the exact same place so sometimes you do get that 
and it's a little you can you can try to adjust that to make it come up as the but as long as it's within that project zone you're okay so yes yeah 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 exactly and that's why with our in terms of accuracy I, i'm glad you brought that up we we look for accuracy that's under 500 meters so if it's close enough to be there then it's something we'll consider but if it's five miles away or five kilometers away, we're not going to probably consider that because it's not accurate enough for our, our purposes. Yes. It's in iNaturalist, but it's not necessarily in the project. Is that what you're saying? Is, so did you, do you know that your time zone is, is the right time zone? It's, uh, you'll be surprised how many people the time zone is Hawaii because they got their account on the phone. Oh, pretty much right away. Okay, so you should be okay, but you might double check that just to make sure. Yes. Yes, I'm going to show you how to join a project here in just a moment. Uh, well, actually, on my account, so we'll, we'll do it for real. Okay, I, I may, I probably haven't answered all of that, but afterwards we can maybe talk a little bit more about that. So a taxa-specific project, if you just want to track a certain species or a group of species, you can do a project like this. You can do a property base. This is my home project. Um, I've got a 0.22 acre yard, most of which is a house and a garage. And I've had 457 species so far join that little yard. And not all of them are flying through my airspace, so just don't go there. Okay. Um, but it's amazing what happens when you start looking at what's around you. Um, truly is. Importance of iNaturalist. We get a lot of data that we can't get any other way. And one project that we have, Herps of Texas, our funding comes from Pittman Robertson for the Wildlife Division. That's the sale of guns and bullets, that kind of thing. That's where a lot of our revenue comes. We can't, we are not allowed by federal law to use any of that money to study Herps because they're not hunted, right? So we have to depend on community scientists to help us figure out where these critters are and researchers. So this kind of becomes a very valuable project. So we've put in over 6,000 now observations into the tax, Texas Natural Diversity Base for my naturalists that would never go in there if it weren't for y'all, okay? And the other neat thing about that is we've gotten some, so many observations, good observations that a couple of species have been able to be taken off the list because they're more common than scientists thought they were. Okay, because the general public was contributing. I was watching a commission meeting one day and this slide popped up and the small game guy was looking for more opportunities to hunt for people to hunt squirrels in Texas. One of the things he did is he pulled up the maps of the gray and the fox squirrel to see where they're, been, where they're distributed. He could compare that to where permits are issued and see if there's a way to expand more hunting opportunities. Again, using our naturalist, pretty and that's just pictures of squirrels, for God's sake. Blows my mind. I never, I just, I was stunned by that. And of course, the big winter storm we had not that long ago, we had lots of people calling us uh, across the state saying, I've got these, all these animals dying. So we created a project and said, take a picture of them, get them up here so we could document. Uh, Texas um, TMN Tuesday, we did a like a three hour presentation on this a couple of years ago. If you go to the main webpage, you can actually watch it. It's pretty fascinating how much wildlife was lost. That's just the tip of the iceberg, as it were. The other thing with iNaturalist, this is uh, an example from the, the uh, uh, City Nature Challenge. During those four days, we had 84 community scientists to every one biologist. So the leverage we can have, the impact we can have is pretty dramatic. And then there's old Sam right there. And his colleagues. So what they're, some places are able to do, and Sam's been a master at doing this, is showing the cities, hey, you've got these little parks, and they may not value them that much. And then they go and they start looking at iNaturalist and how many people are going and visiting and how many species are there. All of a sudden, they become more interested in those little green spaces. So for planning, for city planning, it can be a very powerful tool. So in terms of bio blitzes, again, so you're trying to find as many species as you can in a certain amount of time. Okay, so it's giving you a snapshot. Um, it can, a lot of times bio blitzes are coordinated between uh, professional biologists or researchers and the general public. 
The first one was conducted officially in 1996. So they haven't been done for that long, actually. So there's our bio blitz. There's your place. And uh, that wetland is really nice. Oh my gosh, I love it. So if you're coming with us this afternoon, if you have a fancy camera, bring it because birds are hard to photograph with your phone. Um, bring your iNaturalist app ready to go. One thing on your iNaturalist app when you're doing a bio blitz and you're gonna be taking a lot of pictures and you only have so much battery life in your phone is there's a button you can turn to, uh, to turn off automatic upload. So you take a picture of something and then you just hit save. And then when you get back and you have battery power and you have uh, internet, you can turn that back on and it'll automatically upload your images. And I'll show that to you for those of you that are out there today. There's my, uh, this is my, um, that's me on, on uh, iNaturalist. And there's my uh, email address if you need. If you ever have a question, don't hesitate to give me a call and I'll try to help answer it. Uh, yes, sir. No, no worries. Yes. Oh, say that one more time. Yes. Oh, it's just the different taxa groups. Okay, so green is plants, blue I think is birds or something like that. Yeah, so that's how they break them down. It's by color, simply by color. Now, if, if do we have just another few minutes? What I'd like to do is go to the web page and show you the web page real quickly and do it live. Okay, so this these are my first 26 observations I made this morning while I was out there. So sorry, I got a head start because um, I was excited and it was a beautiful morning. Um, and so that's what that looks like for right now. What I want to show you real quickly um, on the web page, if you go, if I can make this full, yeah, okay. So over here on the upper right-hand corner, that's where your little logo is. If you have a picture of yourself, if you hold your mouse over that, you have a dashboard that's always going to take you all the way back to that's what your web page looks like when you log in. Okay. And if you're ever anywhere else on here and you want to get back to this page, all you have to do is go to the, over here, click on dashboard and it takes you there. Across the top, you have several different, a couple of different drop downs. You can explore observations around the world there. There's your observations, but your observations are also right here on this lower set of tabs. Under community, you can search for people. You can search for projects, okay? You can also search from projects down here and I'm gonna do that that way. Here's the identification thing. If you have an expertise in an area, whether it's butterflies or birds or whatever, if you click on um, identify, what it's gonna do is it's gonna list all of these things that have not been identified by anybody. That, and, and the goal is to get all of, as many things as possible to what's called research grade. That's when two thirds of the people that have looked at that observation all agree to the identification. When they do, then we can, we can assume that, we, well, <laughs> we still check it, but, <laughs> Um, most people aren't on there misidentifying things purposely, um, kind of ruins their reputation. Um, so, you know, for example, here's a caracara. Um, I'd have to look at a map and see where that caracara was found because there's more than one species of caracara in the world. Um, in North America, there should only be one. But you can go in here and search for species. So you could just say, I'm really good at butterflies, not Boutra. And there you go, Lepidoptera, order that, you select that. And these are gonna come up all the species of butterflies, hopefully in North America. Oh, I guess that maybe I should hit go. You know, those basic things are really important. And there's all the butterflies in North America, but now let's say you just only wanna identify them in, let's just really pare it down here, Denton County, Texas, you select that. There are the butterfly, look at all these. These all need identified here in Denton County. So that's a way that you can help go in here. And if you know what it is, you can identify it. And, and so let's say this one right here, I click on that. What's everybody think that is? Yeah, so somebody suggested tiger swallowtail. What I'm gonna do is hit agree. Boy, look at the line of demarcation where they drop off. <laughs> Dang, that's pretty sharp. Then when I'm done with that, notice that this is now kind of faded out. So that means I've reviewed that one, okay? So that's, it. that's how easy it is. And I, that's a great excuse to get out your field guides. You know, y'all bought all those, I've, you know, I've got 
field guides all over. I mean, I'll just lay them all out at my desk and go nuts. Um, um, so that's a way you can help other people identify their thing. All right, so that's identifying. So let's go back to the dashboard again. And then over here, there's tax info. You can go search for individual species. You can search for photographs. Let's say you're putting together a presentation and you need a photograph of something you don't have a picture of and you can't find anybody with it. You can go here and search and there are uh, creative commons rules. Some people will say you can't use my photograph. Most photographs are usable if you, if you give acknowledgement. So you can grab great photos off of iNaturalist to build your presentations. Um, and then in terms of the, um, uh, where is the community? There's the forum, uh, ma'am. There's that forum right here underneath community where you can go and ask a question. And then under here also another place is uh, help. When you go to the help page, I wanted to show you this because it's got tons of information to help answer questions, whether it's through videos or whether it's actual questions that they presupposed you might have. And of course the forum's a great place to get help as well. So on your, on your tabs, here's your profile page. Real quickly, if you open that up, God, it's a geeky looking photograph. I took that a long time ago. Um, then if you want to find out if you're on Hawaii time, you go and hit your account right here. And right here is where it says time zone. And you can just hit the drop down and change it to whatever you need it to be, okay? And just, just remember if you make a check, uh, if you make a change, make sure you find where it says save settings or save or it won't save it, yes. You, so you gotta create a place first before you can make a project because you have to attach your project to a place. So do you see where it says places under more? Okay, so now let's say you need to, what are you, are you looking to create one? Well, so a place is just a boundary. Okay, so all you're doing with the place is creating a space that you want to have a project covering. Okay, so let me, so, so you created your, your place, so you could go, what's the name of the place? Let's go search for it. Thrive. So there it is right there. Okay, so that's your place, and it will show what's already in the in in it. Now, do you have a project created for it? You, you still you still want to have a project. So let me show you how quick it is to set up a project. Okay, because a it looks prettier than this. You you can make it look really nice. And most people aren't looking for places to search for observations; they're looking for projects. I'm not saying what you did is wrong. I'm just saying so. So let's go to projects. These are all mine. Uh, if you click on all projects, for those of you who have to leave, thank you for coming today. I hope I hope this is enjoyable. Th these trainings can go on for hours, so I'll, I will stop. I will stop. I swear to God. So if you want to search for projects, this is where you go. Type in a subject area, you know, butterflies, whatever. It'll populate those. If you want to manage a project, click here. But if you want to start a project, you're going to click on start a project. Okay. So now I'm gonna come down here and there are co collection projects and umbrella projects. A, an umbrella project is a project that oversees a bunch of other projects underneath its umbrella, okay? Most of us don't do that. So all you have to do for collection projects is get started, type in the name of your project. So if you, you could say that you use the same, and I would recommend that so you don't have to remember two different names. So you could type in and, I'll, and so watch. What was it called again? Well, that's simple. How could I forget that? So you put a title, you can put a project icon there. You can choose a banner photograph to make it look nice. If you don't choose a banner, it just doesn't look as appealing. That's just my eyeballs. Yes. Yeah. It does, but so here's what we're gonna do. If you don't have, uh, we're gonna set this project up and then I'm gonna select you as an administrator. Then once you're there, you can go in and do whatever you need to, and then I'll remove myself at some point. Once you have the project set up, you don't have to do anything. You're just, you can shut the project down. You're the only one that can go, I'm done with this project and I'm gonna delete it. 
it doesn't delete the observations, it just deletes the project. You got to take some credit here. Step up to the plate. <laughs> but let me, and I can cancel this, but let me show you how easy it is to do. And I will cancel it so that I don't put that pressure on you. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so we, we've got these things you can add. You can change the color of the banner surrounding it. You have to have a summary. You have to have say what this is. So this is a project no one really wants to be in charge of. I'm just joking. We're not saving it, okay? <laughs> But you got to have the point is you got to have something here. Okay, then you come down. It's a collection project. Include tax. If you leave that blank, that's everything that they can take a picture of anything. Um, include user. If you start adding users, the only people that can submit to it are the people on that list. Leave that blank if it's open to everybody. Here's the big thing: and choose your place. So Thrive Nature Park. So now that's where you choose your place. That's a key to having a project. You got to have a place. Then you come down a little farther, and the only other important thing is you've got research grade, needs ID, any, any over here for that. And if you leave this as any, that means all dates. Anybody that was there before you started your project to whenever, all of those observations are going to populate. Okay. So I'm going to go down here and clear down here. It says administrators. See how I'm populating it because that's I'm the one creating it on my account. So bear with me, okay? I'm not gonna try and scare you here, but if you click done, it usually takes a minute. There's your project. So you that's how easy it is to create a project. You had to make the boundary, and you do that now. You got to do it on Google, um, Google Earth. Because they use they don't allow that on iNaturalist anymore because it takes up too much bandwidth, I guess. So yeah, and usually what I do is I will put the project boundary a little bigger than the actual property, like at my house. Because if you put something right on the edge of your property and that circle for the for the location is is partly in and out, it won't accept it into that project. It's a shape like the area. Yep. On Google Earth, you can literally pinpoint the area all the way around. Point by point, okay? All right, so I'm going to go down here and I'm gonna delete my project because I don't want anybody to see that. So that's how easy it is to turn it off and now you're back to square, okay? Okay. I'm saying, get a project up there, man. Be proud of that. Um, anyway, so good on you for creating the, the place because a lot of people forget to do the place. So that's the project thing, uh, which is pretty easy. Um, Here's your observations. These are all of your observations. And I'm embarrassed by the, the small number, but you can tell where I travel. Um, that's one thing. My daughter lives up here, went on vacation up here. Um, you know, I live, my folks live in Iowa. I travel I-35 and I go to Iowa. <laughs> you track me, <laughs> that's exactly right, yes. Okay, so the normal project, that collection project we pretend created, if you're standing within the boundary, within the place boundary, and you take a picture, it's automatically going to go into that project. Okay? You don't have to select it. Our project, sadly, you have to, you have to not only join our project. So, for example, let me do that real quick. Um, let me go to Texas. You do not have to join. No, it's automatic. It, it, I didn't have to do anything except create that project, go out and take pictures, and it uploaded them all automatically into it. Okay, but that project ends at five o'clock. That's why we can't be in here all day long. All right, so here's our web page, real quick. So if you want to go to our web page and you want to join one of our, or you want to submit to our project, these are called traditional projects, and they were set up that way because. When we pull data, we can get more information off this style of project than a regular collection project. Okay, especially when it comes down to who's identifying it and things like that. It's just more detail that we need. So I, I click on Herps of Texas. Um, let's see here. Down here it says Join Project. So I just click on Join Project. And now when I join that project, I'm saying, okay, I'm part of this project. If I put something on here, 
I trust that they're not going to abuse, they're not going to come on my property and sneak off with my Texas horned lizard. Okay. So, but here's the other thing. You have to physically on your app, if you take a picture of a herp and you want it in Herps of Texas, you have to select where it says projects and then hit the little toggle switch for this particular project. And then that will upload it to that project. Otherwise it will not upload it to that project. Yeah, well, even if you do it and you download it to your camera or you take it on your camera and you put it on here, you're still gonna have to select that project specific, join it and select it to get it to upload. It won't automatically upload, whether it's your computer or the phone. Are you confused? And what's that project? Okay, so that's a collection project. So that's what, that. this is a different kind of project. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, collection project should automatically go. You don't have to join it. You can join it, but you don't have to. No. But let's say somebody, let's say um, you guys wanted to do a subset project and you only wanted Master Nationalists to be able to contribute. You would go under there when you're creating a project and it has the list of names. You'd have to get all of the, the usernames, populate those, and then those are the only people that can put them in. Okay, I don't know why you do that most, but sometimes that, ha that has to happen. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, though, no, those are probably, no, we don't have it. We, we don't have a scat project. Scat projects are probably just, um, um, just regular collection projects. So if you have scat, a scat project, if you're in their boundary, they may pick it up and pull it into that project. But you can go to projects and search for scat, right? So let me show you one last thing and then we're done. I promise, I, I really do promise. Okay, so this morning I took some pictures with my camera and now I wanna upload. So over here I've, on one screen, I've got a picture of this bird I'm gonna upload and I've got this picture I'm gonna upload. It was still kind of dark, sorry. And I've got this picture I wanna upload and I've got this picture I wanna upload. So I just dra I drag and drop these photographs. You'll notice the date and timestamp are already there. Notice there's no location data because my camera doesn't have GPS. So I've been taking these all at the same place. I was at the same place, right? So one of the things I can do is I can click the select all then go over here to location, click on that. It opens up the row, the globe. I can search for location and I'm going to go clear Creek. Um, let's see, where is it? Heritage, let's add that word, heritage. There it is right there. So now do you notice the circle's really big? So now I can just go ahead and I can, one of the nice things, if I grab one of these white spots, I can make it smaller. I can move it out here. So at least it, it's acknowledging it's that location. If I remember exactly where I took it, I can move this around to the exact place where I took those pictures. But this way, at least you can put them all in the same spot very quickly. Then all you do is hit to update observations. So now I've got a location, okay? Now, in terms of a project, um, one of the things that um, I don't have to, I don't have to add this to the, the project I created because it's already in there or it's, it's going to be already in there. Watch this. So this is loading, what's it going to, my gosh, look at that. That was a brown thrasher. Look at that, it's dark. It's amazing. Let's see if it gets this one. Oh, black belly whistling, limkin, bat. Oh, uh, not as good on that one. This is a great blue heron. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in, if I can type, there it is. Whoops, not heparin. Great blue heron. Okay, this, what's that? Yeah, yeah. So here's Melanerpes. That's a red belly woodpecker. And then we've got this one here. We got this little tiny bird with all these tree limbs. And by golly, it picked out downy woodpecker. Okay, so now if I have other projects I want to add, so let's say I wanted, these are all birds, so I click on projects, I come up here and here's birds of Texas, I can go ahead and click that and they go all into birds of Texas. Okay. Right, yeah, I should have done select all. So let me, let me do select all again. So now they should all be in there. 
yeah, they're all in there now. So that's one way you can you can do that, okay? There's way more things you can do, but we're gonna stop there. So I'm gonna submit those. And these are separate from the other 26 that I took with my phone, okay? So now just to be fun and check, let's go to projects. Let's scroll down to here, Clear Creek right there. Click on that. And there they are. Automatically went into that project. I didn't have to do anything to add them to that project. Okay, but to get them into Birds of Texas, I had to join the project and then select that project. Does that make sense with everybody? Okay, so people, we need to get busy because this dude is racking up numbers. Dang, okay. Does, it, does anybody have any other questions? I'm probably ready for lunch. I know I am. I'm sorry, what? Yes. Yeah, so for example, um, if I go back to observations, yeah, so he was asking if you can upload an observation to more than one project. If I go to, uh, I want the grid, if I go to this observation, I just look at this observation, let's see what it went into. Look at all the projects it went into and I didn't do anything other than the birds of Texas down here. So again, it will grab, collection projects grab that observation if it fits their categories and drops it in there automatically. Historical data is very valuable data. Absolutely, you can. The big thing is to have the location data and the date. date you know. All right, well, thank you all. I know that was a long presentation. Um, oh my God, was it that? Wow, I used up all the time. We did, and we appreciate that. We're glad you're here. Uh, anyway, okay, everybody. Off. So I would say one hour admin and one hour, one and a quarter hours for our presentation of AT. Thank you all for coming.